Do you guys hear me? Perfect. Was I was laughing so much in the last talk that I wasn't really sure if this still works. Uh, thank you so much that you guys are here. Um, great to be here. And um, right, so my name is Gilbert Torres, and I'm a climate scientist. And uh, as a scientist, I'm used to other scientists scrutinizing my work and asking me difficult questions. But today, I would like to introduce you to the person whose criticism I fear most. So this is my sister, Lotta. Uh, Lotta is 13 years old. And uh, last time when I tried to explain to her what my research was all about, within, I think, two or three minutes, she got so, so bored that she just left the room and got back to chatting on Facebook. Uh, so I guess we can all agree that telling other people what really matters to us is a very, very difficult thing to achieve. So I told you that I'm a climate scientist, and uh, I think a lot of you here in the room will wonder what a climate scientist actually does. All right, so <laughs> a while back, I was watching uh, television. I was watching this, um, unfortunately, very popular right-wing news channel in the US. I think you all know what channel I'm talking about. And, uh, and the news anchor, a very polemic guy, described climate scientists as people who like to spend their free time in the Arctic. Um, and I'm very sorry about that, but I have to disappoint you. Uh, this gentleman here, that is actually not me, although we look quite alike, I think. <laughs> so, um, so I'm actually not your stereotypical climate scientist who uh, you know, goes on cruises out in the Arctic and um, drills holes in the ice and all that, you know, from the TV. That's not what I'm doing. So the, the question that uh, my research is all about is how climate scientists communicate their knowledge about climate change to the public. And this question really matters a lot to me because every day I'm confronted with this huge gap between the scientific consensus that we have on climate change on the one side, and on the other side, the very low level of public engagement with climate change. So just two weeks ago, actually, the IPCC, which is an international panel of climate scientists, published a newest report on the impacts and consequences of climate change. And this report was written by 700 scientists from 70 different countries on, based on more than 12,000 scientific articles. And this report concluded that climate change was unequivocal and that it is likely that it will have negative impacts on risk from floods and droughts and maybe even affect our food supply and health. And actually, and this is actually heartening, more and more people are getting concerned about climate change. So I read a study that showed that around 90% of Europeans consider climate change an either serious or even a very serious issue. But, and this is the problem, only 25% of the public consider climate change they can personally take care of, they can personally tackle. And for me, this is a really, really big dilemma. So we've got more and more people getting concerned about climate change, but most of the public, the majority, doesn't really understand what climate scientists are telling them about the impacts and how they can protect themselves against them. So I ask myself the question, as a climate scientist, what can I do better in engaging people with climate change and help themselves to adapt to the impact of climate change? Right. So in order to show you some of the answers that I've found, I would like to take you all on a journey, 2,000 kilometers north from here, into the vast forests of Sweden. So these forests have been well, the source of wealth and recreation and cultural identity for people in Sweden for thousands of years. And these forests are also home to the last remaining pockets of wilderness that we have in Europe today. And uh, a brief peek into your living room will probably also show that these forests, of course, are also home to the world's largest furnishing company, IKEA. Um, and last but not least, those of you who have kids, um, these forests have also captured the imagination of children around the world who followed the fearless Pippi Longstockings on adventures. So six years ago, uh, together with my colleagues, um, I launched a research project where I tried to find out what people that own forests in Sweden think of climate change and what they do to cope with its risks. So since 2006, we talked to around 70 people uh, in around 30 meetings. And what I want to do today is to show you five lessons that I've learned about engaging people with climate change and help adapt to its impacts. All right, so the first thing 
that I learned was that I shouldn't be an alarmist. And that maybe sound very odd to you. I mean, imagine you are with your car on the railroad tracks, and uh, you see the train coming. The only thing you want to do is scream, right? That's the first thing that pops in your head. And I just told you that there's more and more scientific evidence that climate change will cause dire consequences if we don't do anything about it. So why am I thinking that it would be a bad idea for me to go out there and tell people how terrifying and catastrophic things may become in the future? Well, I found there's two things that are very, very problematic with being an alarmist. Well, so first of all, if you're spreading fear, that may be an effective tool to, to you know, increase awareness and concern amongst a few people over a short time. But after a while, people get actually skeptical. They will start to wonder what you're really after. And, and probably worse, there will be more and more people who will start wondering if what you're telling them is actually a hoax. And there's something else problematic with being an alarmist. And that is the simple truth that scared people are remarkably bad at making smart decisions. Right? So when I talked to the forest owners in Sweden, there were a few who were very concerned, who felt powerless and without any opportunity to do something about climate change. And that feeling of powerlessness was what really kept them from taking action. The second thing that I had to learn was that I had to speak in a plain and simple language, as I hopefully do today, um, because I'm a scientist. And, uh, well, I confess that I'm sometimes overcome by this irresistible desire to, you know, speak in very, very complicated terms. Um, so complicated terms like, you know, climate change or uh, emission scenarios or statistical significance. Um, and all these terms, um, they might be very, very knowledgeable, and they might mean a lot to me and my scientific peers, but I think to a lot of people out there, amongst you, they just sound an awful lot like scientific gibberish. And that problem with scientific gibberish is that a lot of people don't think that they're smart enough to form their own opinion. And there was something else I observed um, about climate scientists when they talk to the public, and that is that many of them have a really, really hard time to tell the public what they know and what they don't know yet. So I have a very good friend, Patrick. Um, Patrick works at the Swedish Meteorological Office, uh, and we both traveled out there and talked to the forest owners. And in one of our meetings, Patrick used the word uncertain 35 times in 30 minutes. Imagine you want to buy a new car, and the car dealer says uncertain 35 times. I mean, you, you wouldn't buy that car, right? You wouldn't. And th this person will probably go out of business very soon. The third thing that I had to learn was that I had to put myself into my audience's shoes. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, just over Christmas, I bought a new pair of shoes. Uh, not these ones. Uh, black leather shoes. They are amazing. They are just beautiful. But I'm not kidding. The first time I had them on, my feet were literally bleeding. So the lesson that I learned, of course, the hard lesson I learned, was there isn't just one size fits all. And I think all of you can agree here. Um, and that's exactly what I learned about talking to people with climate change. What I had to do was to take the scientific information that we have and break it down, tailor it to the needs and experiences of the people I talk to. Because that's the only way you make information relevant to them. So I'll tell you what I did. The first thing I did was that I talked to the forest owners about measures to reduce the risk from storms. Because storm risk is something that they're thinking of every day. That is really their primary concern. And then I developed the discussion and said, okay, how can these measures help you to adapt to the impact of climate change? That's the first thing I did. And the second one, and that's probably even more important, is that I took the information that we have about global climate change and tried to translate it what it actually meant locally, where the forest owners lived. So Sweden, as you of course know, is very close to the North Pole. And because of its proximity to the North Pole, climate scientists actually expect climate change to be much stronger in Sweden than on a global level. So over the next 100 years, we might expect climate change to go from 2 to 4 degrees warmer, that's temperature increase, but in Sweden, because it's so close to the North Pole, we're looking at 6 to 8 degrees. 
And that was really a wake-up call to a lot of people we talked to. The fourth thing that I learned was to be patient. I tell you what I don't mean with, with being patient. I don't mean that I should behave like, a, like the deer that is caught in the headlights, so that I'm just too terrified of telling people what climate change actually means and what it can result. What I mean is, if you just look at the picture here, um, there's people having fika. So having fika is a Swedish tradition, and it's something we love to do with our friends and loved ones. And fika usually involves very, very strong coffee, much stronger than Italian coffee, a large amount of cinnamon buns, lots and lots of them, and most importantly, a very long, proper chat about things that are bothering us. And I think learning about climate change should be much more like having fika. It should be something that isn't just informative, and it should be something that is enjoyable, rewarding, and something that we want to do again. So, the fifth thing that I learned, and the last thing, was that I as a scientist, had to become a trusted member of the community. What do you mean by that? Well, imagine you are, you are secretly in love with a person, right? and a complete stranger turns up and tells you that this person actually reciprocates your feelings. Would you believe that stranger? Would you trust that stranger? I mean, imagine how embarrassing it could be for you, right? So earning trust is something that is very, very important in our interaction with other people people and when we talk to them. And that's exactly what I had to do when I talked to the forest owners. The first thing I had to do was to earn that trust. And earning that trust really, really meant that I had to answer critical questions and confront skepticism. Because that's, and that's very important to me, is critical thinking was what made lots of people, in particular climate scientists, aware of climate change, somewhere in the 1980s. So I can't expect people to just simply believe what I'm telling them. I actually don't want that. I want them to critically question what I'm telling them and then form their own opinion. And the second thing I learned about earning trust was that it was a lot about being approachable. One of the most gratifying experiences I had in my research was then at the very end of our discussions and meetings, there was one forest owner who came up to me and asked me if I wanted to speak at a workshop. And this workshop was in a really tiny, tiny place, a thousand kilometers north from Stockholm, in a small village where you're more likely to encounter a herd of reindeer than a single human being. And um, the fact that I was invited after all those discussions had taken place, and not at the beginning, showed me that earning trust isn't just about being honest, it is also about being dependable and accessible. So I want to take you back now to the beginning of our journey and want to revisit what I have learned about crossing the gap between climate scientists and the public. What have I learned about engaging people with climate change and help them adapt to its impacts? So these are the five lessons um, that I just presented to you. The first one is I shouldn't behave like an alarmist because scaremongering will give a lot of people the feeling that they are powerless and they're getting manipulated. The second thing I learned was I had to speak in a plain and simple language. And that, and essentially that meant that I had to express both the quality of climate science as well as its limitations. The third thing that I had to learn was that I had to put myself into the audience's shoes. I had to take the information that I had about climate change and tailor it to their needs and experiences. The fourth thing was I had to be patient. Because fostering public engagement with climate change means to give people time to learn about what climate scientists are telling them, and they can try it out and test it. And the fifth thing that I learned, and last thing, was that I had to become a trusted member of the community. And building a, a trust relationship, a partnership, means to be honest, means to be dependable and accessible. What do I want to leave you with today? Two weeks ago, I was interviewed by a journalist of a Swedish radio station. And at the very end of our interview, I was asked if I felt pessimistic about the future and about climate change. And this is what I said. I was born in the 1980s in East Berlin. And when I was growing up as a child, I was acutely aware of the looming threat of nuclear war. 
I knew that if the Cold War would start, my city was the primary target, both sides of, of the Atlantic. Today, the world that my sister is growing up in looks very different. She grew up long after the Cold War ended and the Berlin Wall had fallen. But today, climate change is one of the biggest challenges that is facing our world. But the lessons that I've learned about engaging people with climate change made me confident that together, climate scientists and the public can work together to master this new challenge just as we've mastered other challenges in our history before. Thank you. Thank you.